Welcome to the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region Speaker Series Session. We will begin the program momentarily. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome, and thank you for joining the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region Speaker Series Session. My name is David Cruz, and I'm honored to be today's moderator. We are grateful to have you join today's conversation and hope you'll leave more informed and inspired about the work of the Red Cross. Today's session is being recorded, and you are in listen-only mode, so we can give our full attention to today's speakers. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, feel free to submit them in the chat box where I will review and compile them. Our speakers will try to get to as many of them during our question and answer session towards the end of the program. Remaining questions will be answered in a follow-up email along with a recording and a survey. Today, you'll hear from three outstanding speakers who will share a few updates and stories on how the Red Cross is innovatively responding to disasters using technology. With that, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Adrio, Regional CEO of the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region. She has been at the Red Cross for over seven years and has been in the role of Regional CEO for one and a half years now, leading a team of more than 7,000 volunteers and approximately 75 employees to provide Red Cross programs and services to more than 10 million residents across 15 counties through our five chapters. Thank you and welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, David. As David shared, I've been with the Red Cross for over seven years now, but there's no other time I've seen this organization more resilient than it is now. 2020 was quite a year for all of us, but it's been amazing to see how adaptable and flexible our Red Cross and our employees and our volunteers are for those in need. As you know, we impact lives every day. Across the country, our volunteers and staff are doing incredible work to assist and support over 30,000 individuals daily through our five lines of service. Let me start by saying the last nine months have been like no other. Um, since July 1st of this year of 2020, for example, we've uh, continued our mission delivery work in addition to responding to the largest wildfire season in our history. We assisted over 250,000 people who evacuated and we relied over on over 800 volunteers who worked tirelessly over 100 days ensuring people had places to stay, were fed, had medical and mental health needs taken care of, and eventually assisting them into recovery. That's just what we call our gray sky work. In addition, we were providing over 51,000 life-saving blood donations to hospitals, including convalescent plasma for COVID patients. We support over 7,000 volunteers who have given over 100,000 hours in just the first part of this year to support the mission of the Red Cross. We responded to another 600 disaster events, and mostly those are single-family home fires. And those are the largest disasters that we Red Cross respond to. And that touched over 1,300 people in our local communities. In addition, we supported over 1,700 military service members and their families. And that's just all within the last six months. And though COVID has forced us to change how we serve all those in need, the need in our communities remains and our Red Cross mission remains the same. We pivot our work to account for all of this and in all lines of service, delivery, ensuring that safety of our workforce and the people we serve come first. In disaster services, nearly all of our disaster workers help via video or phone. Uh, we had temporary evacuation centers and sheltered in hotels instead of doing the typical congregate shelters that we would do in the past. During blood services, when donating blood, of course, face masks required, all donations have to be scheduled ahead of time and all hands have to be sanitized and all beds are six feet apart. Our, all of our donations are tested for COVID-19 antibodies and we've been able to produce convalescent plasma. In a service to armed forces and international services, many workshops have been led online, including ones to help military families cope during this pandemic. And volunteers continue to sew and send face masks to our military installations and veteran hospitals and helping homeless veterans. 
We continue to provide our online courses training for humanitarian law. In our training services and community preparedness, we continue to offer our life-saving courses like CPR, AED, and first aid with safety protocols. Uh, we had safety protocols in place and online learning opportunities. We've kept this going because it's also helped our medical professionals and other workers stay current on their certifications. We continue to push out preparedness information on our responses with COVID-19, particularly through our Red Cross emergency app. You're going to hear from our next speaker about how we're using technology specifically in regard to disaster response, but I wanted to share also a few other areas where the Red Cross is really embracing technology and leading its field. Most recently, the American Red Cross was recognized for innovation by receiving the 2021 Business Intelligence Group Innovation Award for the pace at which the American Red Cross has been transforming its technology. We joined a select group of innovative organizations like City Ventures, Lyft, and Gap Gemini in receiving the Innovation Award this year. We are the only nonprofit in the selected list of organizations spanning different industries across the globe. The Red Cross also won a People's Choice Webby Award for the Alexa blood donation feature. This award is one of the leading international awards honoring excellence on the internet, and this feature was singled out as one of the five best in the world in its representative categories. The Alexa blood donation features help to users to schedule a blood donation appointment, find blood drives nearby, and get notification reminders before their appointment, all by simply ask, asking your amaze Amazon Alexa. You'll have to try it out for yourself. We also have been able to launch Clara, the disaster response chatbot on redcross.org, and through our first data blood donation apps through Google. Clara helps drive folks curious to learn more about essential disaster information instantly, but can also answer questions about things such as where do I donate and how to help with a donation? How do I apply or to be a volunteer or volunteer remotely? Um, resources for veterans or military members as a, or members of the military and so much more. We leverage crowdsourcing projects to extend the impact of our humanitarian mission. Missing Maps is one such project where through the kindness of digital volunteers, we help map communities, communities around, around the world. This vital location information enables international and local NGOs to better respond to crises affecting those areas. Finally, the Red Cross has 11, count them, 11 different Red Cross mobile apps in the Apple App Store or Google Play for free. In addition to having preparedness in your pocket and how to respond to natural disasters, one app is the first aid app where you can have instant access to information on handling the most common first aid emergencies. You also have an emergency app that monitors more than 35 different severe weather and emergency alerts to keep you and your loved ones safe. We have a pet first aid app to help your furry friends in case of emergency. We have a hero care app, which is wonderful if you're part of the military or have a loved one who has joined the military. Hero Care connects you to most important resources to help through emergency and non-emergency situations. There is even a fun and informative app for parents and kids called Monster Guard that teaches preparedness for real life emergencies at home. These apps are all free and available to you at your fingertips. We have only been able to continue our work due to this flexibility and adaptability of our workforce, and our workforce is mostly volunteers. Integrating and embracing new technology that is available at our fingertips and become more efficient with me methods so that we can do more with less. Whether it's leading a wildfire response through video meetings or providing touchless financial assistance. Much of what we have been able to learn in this COVID environment will stick and it allowed us to get creative in our response methods, but still ensure we are serving people in need. Our communities need us now more than ever and your support is what allows the Red Cross to be there, even if it's virtually. Thank you for your support. Thank you for providing that amazing Red Cross overview and update, Jennifer. I'd now like to introduce you to Denise Everhart, Disaster Executive of the Pacific Division for the American Red Cross. She has been with the Red Cross for eight years and is responsible for disaster cycle services, which covers our preparedness, response, and recovery programs across 10 Red Cross regions. I'll turn it over to Denise to share more about our use of technology during disaster response and how you can get involved. Welcome, Denise. Thank you, David. 
as David shared, my name is Denise Everhart, and as disaster executive, just to give you an idea of my territory, uh, the Pacific Division is Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, California, and all of the Pacific Islands. So if it's a state, a commonwealth, or a territory, it's ours. And, and we are broken into 10 regions, and we're the front line of disaster response. Everything from home fires to major disasters, the American Red Cross is there in our communities every single day. And like Jennifer said, 2020 was a record-breaking disaster season on top of a pandemic. Um, it built on rec record-breaking years. 2017 was a really big year for us. 27, 2018 got even bigger, not just here in California, but also across the country with hurricanes. From wildfires um, this summer where we burned 5 million acres across the entire Pacific Division and Colorado, but mainly the Pacific Division, to multiple hurricanes. Louisiana got hit five times by hurricanes this year. This year was just back-to-back -back disasters stacked one on top of the other, and the American Red Cross was there. We responded, and we helped shelter people and give them food and comfort. And, and we help more people than we've ever helped before. Red Cross volunteers from across the country jumped in to help. And I really want to applaud the volunteers from this region. The Northern California Coastal Region volunteers have been through year after year of disaster season. And this year, like in previous years, so many were affected. They were affected by having to evacuate their home. They were affected by the COVID pandemic and they still responded. Um, we, we had such good response and that was so very important because while the August wildfires and the September wildfires and October wildfires were ongoing, we also did have those enormous responses down in Louisiana and up in Oregon. And really this region's volunteers showed up every day, day after day, people like Betsy, who you'll you'll hear from later. And, and they're the ones that really kept our focus on the servant service to the clients that are in this area. COVID-19 added a whole new layer of complexity to the world um, and to our mission. As Jennifer said, our mission didn't change, but how we did our mission changed. And I'll dive into how all of this works in a minute, but using a tool called RC View, you can see it up in the corner, we were able to track the number of cases of COVID, business and school clothing closings, this helped us ensure that our workforce was safe and that our service delivery was reactive to what was going on in communities. COVID started on the West Coast, but it rapidly moved across the country and having these tools enabled us really to keep up with what was happening with the pandemic. We're concerned about our volunteers. We wanted to make sure that we would be safe. We were also concerned about how many would be able to respond. Um, but they showed up this year. We had more volunteers deploy on disasters than any year before, and we recruited thousands of new volunteers. We did move a lot of positions to virtual positions, and that ended up being a great technological leap forward for us. Um, we were able to set up virtual mentoring as well. And when I first went came to this job, I'd go on disaster relief operations, and there would be a wall of sticky notes. And when I'd say, what is that? They would say, oh, that's every shelter we have open. And, and it drove me crazy because how do you share that with partners? And if a sticky note falls off the wall, does it mean a shelter closed? Um, and, and so this RC View, Red Cross Visual Interactive Event Wizard, none of us use that long term. We all just call it RC View. Um, but it allows us to share with people what's going on. It's our disaster event management system. It enables us and our partners to share a visual situational awareness and to draw on real-time data to better manage our disaster operations. RC View provides maps and data vis visualization. It allows for better situational awareness up and down the organization. Um, our volunteers on the ground can all log into this and see what's going on. So can our national leadership. We can get a common picture of where we are, what the risks are, and we can share information about our partners. And, and it does take real-time disaster information and it can model that.
Um, it supports all of our disaster efforts. Most of the data that we collect feeds right into the system so that we can make those service delivery and data div data driven decision making. I have a hard time saying that, but I do it all the time. Um, it also helps feed some of those apps that Jennifer was talking about. RC view is a place where we can see where our shelter operations are. We those are also shared in our shelter apps, so we have the common common operating picture across the disaster. So how does it work really in action? Mapping has helped us better serve all of our clients all the time. We can do damage modeling. We can layer in Twitter feeds and Facebook posting and all that other social media app that is out there. And if you see a section, if if let's just say it's a wildfire and we layer in that social data information and you see that people are all talking, but they're not talking in one area, we can draw conclusions from that that can better help us, us do our service delivery. Either it overlaps where the fire is and an evacuation is, or maybe the power's out. And maybe that's why people aren't aren't communicating. It can help us map where big box stores are closed so that we know nobody can go to Home Depot and get a tarp. We can send tarps there. It helps us across all of our lines of service really get an idea of what's going on in, in the ground and to actually map out our service delivery. So whatever we're doing is really responsive to the client needs that allows us to better use our volunteers and better target that service delivery. This is this is a map from a hurricane um, and it shows us where food and water resources are needed. That would that enable us to plan the whole thing. In the past, we, we would have just either opened locations where we thought something was happening or we would have just driven everywhere filled vehicles full of supplies and sent our volunteers out. This lets us really pinpoint and be more effective with our service delivery. We can also add in information from our clients. Our clients call us and they call FEMA and they call other places. And if we can track and map that, that can help us and our partners know where to, where to direct that service delivery. And we can break it down by the needs that people are telling us. So people call up, call our call center and they're asking for financial assistance. We know, okay, let's, they're ready for financial assistance at this point in time. Their, their food and water needs have stabilized and we can make that pivot. This information helps us be so much more responsive um, we also draw on that information from anything that people do on those Red Cross apps. So where where they they check that they're safe, they check that they're okay. That also drives everything we do. What this can help us provide to our clients is kind of a constant contact with the Red Cross. So if they register with us, if we sign them up for through RC Care. Um, which is one of our programs for assistance, we can constantly be getting back in touch with our clients. We can, if they agree to let us share that information, we can share that information with our partner. And we can actually pull in other partners' information into this RC View platform. We have a partner hub so that Salvation Army can make sure that they're not feeding where Red Cross is feeding. And what we've really seen through our partners, through our government partners and our community partners, is there is such appreciation and better understanding of what the Red Cross does in a disaster response and really an understanding of where we are and why we're where we, we are and that the focus is on the clients. Um, it, it's I know that's a quick bird's eye overview of how we utilize this tool, but this is really, I can't emphasize enough how much this has transformed our disaster response and really enabled us to help more clients with the right help at the right time. That also helps us with our volunteer engagement. Our volunteers feel like they are really being utilized to offer the right help to the right clients at the right time. And, and this tool and technology have enabled us to really give everybody a better experience and give everybody that, that Red Cross hope. Um, I'd love for David back to you and thank you for the time.
Thank you, Denise, for sharing how we use these helpful tools. A lot of great work is being done. I know you may have questions for Denise, so just a friendly reminder to submit any questions you have in the Q&A feature for any of our speakers. We'll get through as many as we can towards the end of the program. With that, it's my honor to introduce to you our Mission Moment speaker today, Betsy Whithone. Betsy and her husband Andy have been volunteering with the Red Cross since 2017 in several different capacities as a recovery coordinator, disaster action team lead, and now she leads our direct services team to respond to disasters from fires, floods, and even volcanic eruptions. In fact, she is currently the job director for the Debris Flow Response Operation in Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Mateo counties. Betsy currently serves as a Disaster Services Chair for our Red Cross in Napa and Sonoma County and was recently awarded the Jean Beck Memorial Volunteer of the Year Award for her commitment and selflessness to her work in long-term disaster recovery. Please help me welcome Betsy Whithome. Thank you, David. Yes, Andy and I began a volunteering with the Tubbs fire, continued through the Kincaid fire, and most recently in this unprecedented 2020 wildfire season that Denise just told you some of the metrics around. I thought I knew disaster response for wildfires. Yep, got this. But as Denise and Jennifer told you, responding to a disaster during a pandemic added a whole new level of service delivery. In, case, in fact, we had to create a COVID compendium to capture all the new processes that we were putting in place, um, primarily around keeping everyone safe, as safe as possible from the pandemic. Well, I started working as, a, when I started working as a volunteer, I started working with clients and I love um, the direct interaction with our clients. This year, uh, last disaster season and right now, I've had the opportunity to commute, com contribute in several operational management roles, both here in NCCR and in our region to the south, Central California. The tools that Denise just showed you were so incredibly helpful in managing our operations. In fact, we have a site on RC View right now for the uh, disaster operation that's happening down south in uh, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Mateo counties. By the way, Denise, I know that Red Cross has 17 pages of acronyms, um, and I never guessed that RC View was one of them. <laughs> and I'd guess that our Red Crossers on this call learned that for the first time too. And it's a wizard, it just does so much. And frankly, within this current disaster, we're doing a little groundbreaking. When uh, folks um, we, uh, have to evacuate for fires, the first place they go, and this is through COVID, they go to a temporary evacuation point. And from there, then um, those that are vetted um, as eligible for uh, housing, meaning they're from a mandatory evacuation site uh, location, then we will put them into um, housing. So TEPs, a temporary evac, there's an acronym, temporary evacuation points are very important to be able to have on our map so that um, our county partners, our staff, everyone knows the addresses for those and can direct people there. It's new um, and it's new because of COVID, the pandemic and we're getting there. Um, during Kincaid, we had a, thought we had a lot of shelters when we had 16. During our NCCR wildfires, we had over 300 at the peak. It wasn't like before where we knew everyone in the shelter was our client and we knew who to feed and idea how each of our clients was doing. And our, our, our hotel, Shelters were hotels, and we had a small scat smattering of rooms um, in these hotels. So in regards to data from that, we had an explosion. We had multiple tracking, we had multiple tracking tools for the many services we were providing for over 2,000 people in 130 hotels um, at the time that this map shows. But what the good news is that the state took over payment of these hotels at about two weeks after the start, but this meant they had the data of who was where, not us. And as we do, we provide the wraparound services of feeding, health services, recovery services um, for these clients. So we had to quickly develop research to call them and where they are in the hotels, find out what their needs were, and develop, develop tracking mechanisms to know who wanted what, where they were, and where to get what they wanted, like meals. 
um, which we were also coordinating with the state. This map you see showed the 137 hotels on September 3rd and was developed for the feeding team. It was to enable them to build routes and to know how many meals the drivers would be delivering at each site based on the info we received from the state. This is a, a map that exists, existed in RC view. It was amazing operation with over 70% of the responders being virtual using the tools your donations support, Microsoft Teams, Excel, Salesforce, Facebook, and the Google suite of products. We knew going into the season that these non-congregate shelters, which we call it, another name for this type of shelter, the hotel rooms, were going to require new tracking tools. So we set them up we, and had the tracking ready, but we learned midst response how these needed to be tweaked. From my role of being responsible for this part of the, for part of the operation and making sure services were delivered, our teams revolutionized how, how data was tracked. With the state of California's partners, we, we matched their data and put it into tools that were used in that, those disasters in the fall, and now we're using again, um, capitalizing on the lessons learned in the fall and applying them in the, the response we have right now. RC View depended on information from all these tools, some of which are now becoming national standards. I finished that job as job director, and I can tell you that I used RC View for the numbers on it frequently, not, not only specific numbers, but trends as well. Okay, another mission moment here, um, and you may have heard some in the past, but this one is one that really touched me, and uh, you, it's the essence of what Red Cross does, providing the hope and comfort for the people impacted by the disasters. This happened to me when I was deployed to the Creek Fire down in Fresno County. I spent most of my time in operations management, helping to keep a handle on our hotels and ramping down the operation. There were still some fires up in, way up in the Sierras and people um, though were just being able to go back to the areas that um, where the fires had been put out. It was still real smoky. So this photo here shows you, do you remember the news reports of the lake? This was in early September in the Sierras where we saw that people were trapped and had to be airlifted out. Well, this is a photo of that, that helicopter that came in and had to use infrared uh, cameras to see through the smoke to rescue these folks. It was part of our disaster response. It was Shaver Lake. And for me, a disaster gets real when I see what our survivors experience. On my day off, I went up into the mountains and saw why they couldn't get out. There, there was trees burnt on both sides of the road. It, 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 it cut off the pathway for them to get out. There were houses burnt here and there among the forest. This is a mountain area. And um, so when I got up there, um, driving up the road, I saw the recovery begin to happen. Utility companies were beginning to put in back in power poles and put back in uh, telephone lines and electrical lines. At the village near the lake, our DES unit, there's an acronym, uh, Disaster Emergency Supply um, Station was set up under a white pop-up tent. They had been handing out supplies to the, the people that had been, who lost their homes or had been, were re recovering and cleaning them up for over a week. They were given out rakes, shovels, sifters, tarps, gloves, goggles, masks. It was still smoky up there. And you can see how these, this team um, was practicing uh, safety with their six feet apart. They were um, wearing masks, that's what I saw. But that's not what re not really got me. In that area, we tend to focus on the folks who's lost their year round homes. But in this area, not only did that happen, but there were a lot of summer homes up there and cottages that had been in the families for years and years and years. These cottages held summers of memories of family visits up there. Cottages were now lost in fire. I learned this because our team had struck up conversations with people who had stopped um, by, gotten supplies. This, the team would wave at the um, folks as they came by and the um, this was not just passenger cars, it was utility cars too, and everybody would greet them back. It was a connection that was made to the community 
um, it, it was helping the community recover um, the whole community, one person at a time or one family at a time. It's it was genuine. It was caring. It was the essence of what we do. And your your donations funded the supplies and some of us who deployed in from out of town and everyone on that operation brought their hearts to the recovery. It was pretty special watching that in action. So thank you for all you do and thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Betsy, for sharing your incredible story and experience. We thank you for all that you continue to do in support of our community in a moment's notice. And a big thank you once again to all of our speakers for providing such valuable information. We've had a lot of great questions come in that we'll jump right into and we can get through as many as we can. Our first question is for you, Denise. Can you speak to the data maps that we are using overlaying in RC view? So I, I, I believe I know what this question is asking. I think this question is asking about the different layers that we can use to kind of map what's going on. So we can add in uh, weather, social vulnerability, other uh, other open sources of information to really um, get a full picture. We've layered in public source uh, imaging information from people like CAL FIRE um, to really give us the disaster and the evacuation, uh, National Weather Service, wind speed, those type of things. Um, we really we really can kind of kind of get a good idea using more sources than just our eyes on the ground. We're one of the best sources, but we're one of many. I think I answered that question. Thank you, Denise. Our next question is for Jennifer. When the COVID threat has passed, is the plan to revert to traditional sheltering models or will we continue with the non-congregate sheltering model? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we've been wondering that too. Our hopes are that when COVID um, is under control or people have all been vaccinated and everybody's be able to be out around in some form of normality, that those hotels won't be available to us. People will be using them, traveling, and so we will go back to our congregate sheltering. We will go back to the way that we did it before. And honestly, those of us who um, and our volunteers who love to be with the people that we help are looking forward to that day because not only do we provide services and financial help and all those expertise, but we also supply hugs and hope. And we really miss that part of our mission. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next question is for Betsy. Given that much of the response and aid are now virtual, how did you ensure people in need are aware of these services? Ah, that's a good question. Um, that was something we did have to solve. We used uh, and continue to use and are using right now a combination of the, the uh, communication uh, tools that we do when we're there in person and some additional ones when we because we can't see them. So we have those, uh, as I told you, those temporary evacuation points where people come and we provide information to them as resources there. So we, there are some of us that are in the community. Um, we have, uh, we brought emergency, our ERVs, our emergency response vehicle into the community where we um, were passing out information. We also have um, an external relations group within all disasters that works very, very closely with our government and community partners. So we're informing them so they can include us in all their outgoing communications. And we also um, utilize Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our regional blog to send out information about what we're, um, anything, anything that answers a question of what we're doing to help right now and where you can get it. One of the things that was different when um, Denise was talking about the shelters where we used to have oh, and we will again, may again have stickies that talk about resources. Um, we did a, a lot more calling to, to clients in um, getting in touch with them. So it, it's the RC view the here. Well, they don't attach the RC views, but we, we did much more calling and um, and taking care of them in their in their shelters. Thank you, Betsy. Hope that answers. Our next question is for Jennifer. How can corporate partners such as public affairs emergency responders work with the Red Cross to provide aid and information to those in need? 
Well, I love that question. We don't do anything without partners, whether you're a partner donating your time or your dollars or your resources or your expertise. And this is where your expertise can really come into play. So uh, Betsy had mentioned some of our uh, social media platforms. So, you know, if you follow us on Twitter, you follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook or even on TikTok. Um, you know, share that information with all of the folks that you know. Help us uh, be a, mic uh, a megaphone for the work that we do. Let people know that the Red Cross is there and we we don't discriminate. We help everybody and that's such an important piece of our message that we don't have uh, always a great, great opportunity to get out to folks. Sometimes people are afraid to come and look for help and and we help everybody. We want to, people to know that so. Help us uh, multiply our communication. And oh, by the way, if you have time, we can always use public affairs volunteers. <laughs> so uh, go to redcross.org and find out how you can get involved that way as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next question is for Denise. What's on the horizon for new disaster technology tools? So we are constantly evolving in the disaster space um, and, and we're rapidly adopting as really as many tools as possible. It's really amazing the change in the past 10 years and, and the ability for us to get more on the ground in touch information from our clients. So one of the things that we've done this year is we've been integrating all of our different outreaches to clients kind of under one umbrella, RC care. This way it's not services to the armed forces helping people and then over here on a totally different system, disaster cycle services helping, right? How can we integrate all of those systems into one system where we, we do the maximum to help any kind of our clients? Some of our disaster clients are also veterans and we might have other resources. That's just one example. We're also moving a lot of our uh, dispatch. So when a fire department or somebody calls the Red Cross and then we tell a volunteer to go out, we're working on those systems and we're really open up to, to partner information. Um, we know that we can on the ground talk to anybody who's got one of these um, and, and the more we can find out from people who are on the ground what's happening on the ground the better off we'll be the final thing that we're really starting to look at are some of the trends um, we're really working with partners to look at climate change trends and disaster trends um, and all of those items that that really could help us inform not just the response we're doing right now, but the response that we will be doing next week, next month, next year, and, and how that environment is changing. Thank you, Denise. I would like to encourage our audience to submit any questions you may have for our speakers. And uh, I have two short questions right back to you, Denise. Um, the two questions are, is RC View available to the general public? And to follow up with that, uh, is RC View available to other organizations that provide community support? So uh, RC View is, it, it, yes and. <laughs> um, RC View is an internal system where we really go over some of the details and the data that, that really isn't to be shared because I'll be honest, data is, output is as good as the input and they're oftentimes early on in a disaster where we do struggle with getting some of the numbers right and getting the information so there is an element of that that is internal for anybody with their redcross.org address back to what what jennifer was saying about volunteer at the red cross and you can get into rc view but we also have a partner hub um, and that's really something that we took what we had in our view and our government partners and our, our fellow uh, voluntary organizations, active in disaster partners and our corporate partners said, we, we wanna be able to use this data and we have good data that we could feed into this to make a common picture. So we have built a partner hub and that partner hub is open to, to the outside environment so that we can share that information and build that picture. 
Thank you, Denise. Our next question uh, could be for any uh, three of you. We have a number of corporate partners with extremely talented and skilled staff. How can we best leverage corporate staff to support disaster response technology needs? Who would like to answer that? I think we all would. <laughs> um, you know, redcross.org, sign up to volunteer. Um, there, there are many opportunities that abound. Jennifer can probably talk across more lines of service than just disaster. So I'll say yes, please do and toss it over to Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Yes, yes, please do. So um, yeah, I think the, the best way to do that is to reach out to your relationship manager and um, talk about some of the specific ideas that we could leverage your resources. I think we have ways to plug people in all the time and we do it. Missing Maps is one of those opportunities, but there's all sorts of ways that we can use corporate expertise and the expertise of the people that do that, uh, those jobs for a living. So I would say probably the best thing to do is reach out to your relationship manager and we'll find a way to plug you in easily. Thanks, Denise and Jennifer. Our next question is a little more technical, so I'll send it over to you, Denise. What system was used to build the RC View dashboard and who built it? Um, I think we built it. <laughs> um, you know, it was it was I, I, I can give you as much as I know about it. And, and in some ways I'm an end user. I wasn't a builder. Um, but I was there along the whole build. So we had we had corporate sponsors. Um, who really helped us put together a team to build this incredible environment. In some ways, RC View is the screen that is built on top of other systems that we had. We are moving some of those system, systems over to newer technology built on stronger framework. Um, but RC View, I believe, was built in-house by a team um, due to the generosity of our donors. And if you ask me any more technical details, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. But we can find out. We can find out more detail on that specific question. Yeah. The next question uh, might be for either of you. Has response in the COVID environment through technology unveiled any needs or opportunities the Red Cross is looking to adopt moving forward? I, I'll start and share, and then I'm sure Denise and Betsy could jump in on this too. I, I think the list is endless about what we've learned and, and what we want to execute on and what we might implement. I mean, you know, one of the easiest things to talk about is how we do these Teams meeting and Zooms meeting and video conferencing and how much money we've saved and not traveling and, and those kind of things. So that's clearly something that we'll continue to adopt. I mean, we are a high touch organization, but we want to be high touch and high tech. And I think we've learned to how to how to mix those two during this this time frame. Um, and then this RC view, I mean, I've been with the organization for seven and a half years. This stint, I was there 30 years ago as well, but I've never seen us all get on platforms like I see us do now. I mean, this environment has really, I will say, forced us to learn to use the platforms we have. And we have amazing platforms that we all are now using more uh, regularly and and putting information in and sharing information. So I think it is, it's just using what we have and getting stronger and stronger with that. We just launched a new program called RC Care, and I don't know if Denise wants to talk about that, but um, more technology coming our way as well. Yeah, and I'll take it down to the single family home fire. Um, technology has really enabled us to help our clients in some ways quicker and definitely safer in this COVID environment. So it used to be if your home caught on fire in the middle of the night, the Red Cross would come out um, within two hours, hopefully, of the time that the need was identified. And we still want to do that because some of what we bring are a blanket and a hug. Um, but sometimes if, if the people can't stay there or right now if it's not safe to go out, the use of technology to contact a person and have a discussion with them and then have them take a picture of the damage 
to their home right there. We've done our damage assessment. We've done our due diligence. We can, through RC Care, immediately give them financial assistance. They can go if it's the middle of the night and check into a hotel if that's what they need or go stay with friends and family, but stop by the Walgreens and pick up the supplies they need because we got them the the financial assistance and then the next day we can go and sit down and talk to them about their recovery so technology has influenced how we do everything and covid has in some ways let us take a leap forward to where we can use technology to quicker help our clients um, and and really try and find a way to use that technology going forward even after we get out of this covid environment that virtual option may still be the best option for certain clients in certain situations. So we just built up our toolbox. Thanks, Denise and Jennifer. Our next question uh, could be for Betsy or Denise. Can you share more about the process to identify hotels willing to assist in sheltering and how we go about proactively establishing those relationships? Betsy, she's <laughs> doing it right now. Well, we have um, a partner we work with that does our corporate lodging for us. We um, identified the location where we need hotels and how many people that we're going to need rooms for. And in fact, we're working on that right now in our response for uh, the disaster in Santa Cruz and, and Monterey counties, especially and um, some of, and a uh, little bit in San Mateo. Um, and that they, they are the ones that then um, go out and look, uh, secure the ho hotels for us and closest to where the disasters are, and then we can get our folks into them. Denise, do you want to add any more to that? No, I think you've got it. Okay. Thank you both. A reminder for our audience that technology like RC View uh, would not be possible without the funding from our amazing community partners. Email nccrdevelopment at redcross.org if you would like to learn more about this or other opportunities. Thank you all for the wonderful questions today. We are running close to time with a few minutes remaining. I'd like to have Jennifer wrap up today's session with a few closing remarks. Jennifer? Thanks, David. I'd like to wrap up by starting off with a huge thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today, but more importantly, thank you for all of your support um, through your donations of time, money, um, expertise. You are helping to save lives every single day. We are grateful whether you are new to Red Cross or have been with us for decades for your ongoing commitment to the mission to serve those in need at any given time. Thank you once again for spending part of your day with us and to our speakers for sharing such valuable information. We hope that you're walking away informed about the work the Red Cross is doing and how we utilize technology to respond to disasters in our backyard and across the country and the world. Share something you learned today with a friend. Download one of our Red Cross apps. As I said, there are 11 of those and you can find those in your app store, all free. And if you're interested in learning more, please send us an email with your questions or thoughts. You can go to redcross.org as well. We're planning to host our next speaker series session in spring with a focus on our work around international services and service to the armed forces. That's one of the lines of service that people seem to be surprised by um, that the Red Cross has a lot of work going on in those areas. We're going to have some pretty amazing guest speakers, so keep an eye out for that invite. Have a great rest of your day and thank you for everything you do to support our mission. Thank you, Jennifer. Please keep an eye out for a follow up email with a recording of this session, along with a quick survey to gather your input. Thank you once again to our amazing speakers for a wonderful discussion and to everyone who joined us today. This now concludes today's session.